like to uh, thank everyone for coming, uh, especially uh, to our distinguished uh, guests, uh, Professor Jackie Ying, uh, the Executive uh, Director of the Institute of Bioengineering and Nanotech, Singapore, We've got uh, Prof. Uh, Mahendra Nai, uh, Vice President, Research uh, and Development, Monash uh, University, Malaysia, my fellow colleagues, students and friends. So I would like to welcome you to the 2017 fourth Sir John Monash Distinguished uh, Public Lecture Series. My name is Chan, I'm your host tonight. Uh, the Sir John Monash uh, Public Lecture Series provides Monash uh, University Malaysia, an opportunity to engage the community in Malaysia and the region through the promotion of thought leadership in the key areas that are strategic to the development of the region in the 21st uh, century. So this lecture series uh, takes inspiration from Sir John Monash, who is considered to be one of the Australian most uh, distinguished uh, citizen, scholar, leader, and a man who sought to use his education and abilities for the benefit of the uh, community. So the public lecture series cover a wide variety of contemporary and interdisciplinary topics that will be presented by high profile thinkers, international leaders, policy makers, corporate leaders, and leading scholars who are distinguished in their area of expertise and whose work have made significant impact to the global community. So today, we are very fortunate that we have Professor Jackie Ying to present the fourth Sir John Monash public lecture for the year on the topic entitled Nanostructured Materials for Energy and Biomedical Applications. Before we commence the lecture, please allow me to present Prof Ying's uh, biodata uh, this will not be easy because uh, Profing has uh, many achievements and uh, most of them are equally outstanding. So uh, I will try my best to do you justice. Uh, Profing was actually born uh, in Taipei uh, but raised in Singapore uh, and New York. She received her first degree in chemical engineering from the Cooper Union in 1987. And four years later, she received a PhD in chemical engineering from Princeton University. She became an assistant professor at MIT in 1992 and became its youngest full professor at the age of 35 in 2001. Prof Ying's research interests revolves around the synthesis of advanced nanostructured uh, materials for biomedicals and catalytic applications she has published over 350 articles and has accumulated about 22,000 citations. She has presented over 440 invited lectures at international conferences. She currently sits on the editorial board of at least 36 journals. And she is the editor-in-chief of Nano Today, which is a very reputable journal. This journal now ranks third among 87 journals in the area of nanoscience and nanotechnology. Until now, Profing has at least 45 different awards and honors under her belt. I actually counted them, not easy. I spent a few minutes doing so. To name a few, uh, she was the inaugural winner of the Mustafa Prize for Pop Scientific Achievement Award in 2015. It is worth mentioning that the winner of this prize also received a cash prize of 500,000 US dollar, which is now about 2.1 million ringgit, yeah, on the exchange rate today. <laughs> yeah. She has been named as one of the world's 500 most uh, influential uh, Muslims for six years consecutively since 2012. She had also been elected as a young global leader of the uh, World Economic Forum between uh, 2004 to, two, to 2009. So Prof Ying has also been very successful in commercializing a scientific uh, research. She has over 170 patents granted or pending. 
of which 32 has been licensed to uh, multinational and startup companies. She has also served on the board of directors or advisory boards for 10 startup companies and two venture capital funds. Prof Ying is currently the executive director of the Institute of Bioengineering and Nanotechnology Singapore. This institute was founded by Prof Ying in 2003 and it currently has 150 researcher staff. Under Prof Ying's uh, leadership, the institute has published close to uh, 1,300 papers in leading journals. It has 680 patents granted or pending of which 131 has been licensed. This institute has spun off 12 startup companies and graduated 122 PhD students. I think these are just a glimpse of uh, Prof Ying's uh, achievements. Uh, in short, I can summarize Prof Ying's using one word, multi-talented. To me, she's an outstanding uh, scientist, entrepreneur, and leader. I think I've talked too much, yeah. So without further delay, uh, it's my great pleasure to invite Prof Ying to come forward yeah, to present uh, her lecture. Yeah. Can you please put your hands together? Thank you. Thank you for the very kind introduction. It's really a great pleasure and honor to be here in this uh, very nice campus, uh, Monash University, Malaysia. I'd like to speak to you about nanostructure materials and uh, how we are trying to develop this uh, new technology for various applications uh, for energy and biomedical uh, systems. Okay. So to start with, the research that I'm doing, we're trying to design materials uh, with a dimensional length scale on a nanometer. And it is not only important to control that lamp scale, but also to functionalize materials at that lamp scale. So for example, we are trying to create that out of uh, organic or inorganic material. We're using a dopant or coating, and sometimes we introduce these materials on top of a device. In particular, what I'm trying to say is that we're interested in using this material not only for basic scientific curiosity, but uh, looking at them for applications ranging from pharmaceutical synthesis, green chemistry and energy, in bioimaging, uh, biosensing, diagnostics and drug screening, as well as nanomedicine, drug delivery system, three-dimensional cell culture, control tissue regeneration. So today, what I'm hoping to do is to give you a sense of how we are trying to design and functionalize these materials for this wide range of possible applications. So let me start by energy applications. I think everybody will agree uh, the, one of the most important areas that we need to better develop is energy storage, right? So you're sitting there, hopefully not looking at your handphone, but listening to me. But usually the handphone charging is one of the uh, critical things. If you have forgotten to charge a handphone, the next day you will really um, suffer from not being able to make use of your mobile phone. So what we're trying to do here is to try to increase the capacity of the material. And in, there are two types of material. One is a cathode and one is an anode. For the cathode material, uh, one of the most commonly used material is this lithium iron phosphate material, which you can see has a capacity of about 160. Okay? For the anode material, uh, you have a low operating um, potential and uh, it has a relatively high capacity than a cattle, something on a scale of about 370, okay? So our goal is to be able to increase the capacity of this material while lowering the cost and making sure, of course, that it is safe, right? So besides using mobile devices, one of the key challenges now is to actually power electric vehicles. So for many countries, in the next 20 years, their goal is to basically use electric vehicle and dominate that in the market instead of running on petrochemicals. Okay? So for our goal uh, in this case, we're trying to develop a cathode material in the first example by making use of lithium manganese silicate material. So these materials are very attractive because silicate materials are very inexpensive and it also has a much higher theoretical capacity, twice that 
of lithium iron phosphate materials. The challenge, however, is in the difficulty in controlling the phase purity of this material and we also want to be able to control the particle size and morphology because those aspects can allow us to potentially charge the material and maintain the stability of that material for extended period of time. So if you look at conventional synthesis, uh, typically people use wet chemical synthesis and here you can control the particle size and shape but it is very difficult to obtain highly crystalline phase and difficult to scale it up. On the other hand, if you use solid state reaction, which means bringing it up in a heat treatment to a fairly high temperature, you can obtain material with high crystalline phase. It's easy to scale up, but it is difficult to control the particle size and shape. So what we are trying to do here is to create a new method called wet chemistry associated solid state reaction. So first we will start with a low temperature reaction making use of the possibility to create a nano cube of manganese carbonate and then coat it with silica using tetraethoxysilane as a precursor. At room temperature, we create a coating of silica on manganese carbonate to make a core shell nanotube, nano cube, and then we heat it up at high temperature in a solid state reaction to turn this material into a hollow nano box with the right phase of lithium manganese silicate. So in this synthesis, first we make use of a reverse microemulsion to make this nanocube material. And then we coat it with silica, introduced again in the reverse microemulsion. You see we still maintain the same morphology. And then we heat it up at, in the presence of argon to make this lithium manganese silicate uh, hollow nano box. So in this synthesis, the key here is how do we control the cube size and the thickness of the silica shell. The sh ratio of these two material at the beginning will then govern the stoichiometry of the final material. Okay. So we need to fine tune that and for given lithium hydroxide concentration, we can see that the best thickness that we can get is this 18 nanometer thick silica shell and it is not thick enough to give you the right phase that we want to have. Okay. So what we also have to do is besides changing the silica to manganese ratio, we have to change the lithium hydroxide concentration to get the ideal concentration and the stoichiometry. Okay. So as you increase the lithium hydroxide concentration, what will happen is you will end up with a thicker and thicker silica shell. You can see the shell thickness increase from 18 nanometers all the way to 45 nanometers. And then when you heat it up in higher temperature in argon, you end up with materials that can have the pure phase if you have the right thickness. Okay, so this is a single pure phase. If you have too little of the silica, then you end up having an extra phase of manganese besides the right phase. If you have too much of a silica shell, then you end up with an extra silicate phase. Okay, so this was the first example in successful synthesis of a nanostructure lithium manganese silicate material. We then tested them for battery application and we are very encouraged to be able to obtain a very high capacity, much higher than the 170 uh, capacity that is offered by the conventional material. Okay. And then to increase the columbic efficiency, we introduced a graphene oxide and this reviews graphene oxide, raise the electrical conductivity and allow us to further increase the columbic efficiency and the charge capacity. Even after multiple cycles, we are still able to achieve a very high capacity and we are now working with a leading Canadian company in energy storage, uh, Hydro Quebec, in trying to scale up this synthesis and manufacture it and use it for battery applications. The second example I'd like to give involves developing the anode material. So for anode material, people typically use um, very thin sheets of graphite. And here what we want to do is instead of using carbon graphite based material, use metal oxides. So metal oxides, if you make them in the form of nano sheets, have a lot of attractive properties. For example, they can give you high surface area, they can facilitate the ion and electron transport, which will uh, improve the rate capability. However, they are very difficult to be synthesized in the form of nano sheets. 
So they are very limited example of such a material. What we would like to do is to create a very general synthesis of metal oxide nanosheets. So in this case, we start out with a material that is a layered material, such as graphene oxide. And then we introduce a precursor of the metal oxide on top of this material so that it grows into a nanosheet. And then if you heat it in the presence of argon, you end up getting this metal oxide, graphene oxide nanocomposite. Or if you heat it in air, you will get this metal oxide reduced graphene oxide nanosheets. Okay. We can control the material in terms of crystallinity and the amount of graphene oxide in it. And this graphene oxide is very useful, as I mentioned earlier, it can improve the conductivity. It is a very simple synthesis, unlike the conventional methods. So you can basically manufacture it without using any laborious template removal process and no hydrothermal methods required. Okay. So with this methods, we're able to make all kinds of nanosheet material. Here is one example of niobium oxide. Okay. This niobium oxide material, as we heat it up, we can obtain materials of controlled crystallite size. We can also obtain materials with different yield depending on the precursor of the metal oxide that you use. We can see that the thickness of this um, metal oxide nanosheets is only about two nanometers. Here are all the different metal oxides that we're able to obtain. Ranging from niobium oxide I showed you earlier, we have also obtained various transition metal metal oxides. And this wide variety of nanosheets were reported for the very first time. We control the crystallinity, crystallite size, as well as the reduced graphene oxide content and surface area by simply controlling the heat treatment temperature. We can also make ternary oxide. For example, here is a titanium niobium oxide. This phase was synthesized for the very first time. And using this type of approach, we can then test them for lithium ion battery anode applications. We can see, for example, if you use niobium oxide, if you introduce the reduced graphene oxide, which is shown in blue, you can obtain materials with much better stability and rate capability. If you use a ternary oxide, you can actually obtain very high capability and capacity without using the reduced graphene oxide. Okay. If you choose the right composition, and in this case is uh, reduced graphene oxide with tin oxide shown in red, we were able to obtain very high uh, capacity. We're talking about materials that are over a thousand in terms of capacity, which is several times that of graphite. So this kind of new materials are very exciting. They hold a promise to basically allowing us to develop batteries that will have much higher capacity. And this material, for example, increased the capacity by three, four times. So instead of having to charge your handphone once every day, maybe you can end up charging it once every three, four days. Okay. So now I would like to switch gears a little bit. Just now I talk about nanomaterials in the form of metal oxides. We can also make all kinds of nanomaterials in the form of organic sy systems. Okay. So one such example is carbene. Carbene is an interesting material that is frequently used by the chemists as a catalyst. Okay. They have very good uh, signal domain properties. Okay. So typically, graphene material, uh, sorry, carbene materials are made in the form of single molecules. Okay. So these molecules can be fairly large, but then they are basically organo uh, complexes, and uh, they do not allow chemical engineers to use them in continuous processes. Okay. So as a chemical engineer, we are always trying to make heterogeneous catalysts, meaning solid phase catalysts that can be used in a continuous process so that you can have a much higher uh, productivity. Instead of using a homogeneous liquid phase catalyst that is difficult to recover and reuse and are limited to batch reactions. Okay? So we're thinking about how to turn this into a solid catalyst from a liquid phase catalyst. We decided to do this by doing polymerization. So this is a basic unit. We end up cross-linking it to make it into a main chain polymer. This polymer, you can see, has a very high loading of the active catalyst. 
it is very stable and it is easily synthesized in large quantities. Okay? The most important part is we can turn them into solid particles so that they can be easily recycled and reused and can be used in continuous processes in catalytic reactions. Okay? How do we make this polymer materials? We first look at the linker chemistry R1 and R2. If they are made of these linear-like molecules, you will end up with particles that are not well defined. If one of this linker group is made of this trisbomo metal mesetylene linker, then you end up getting a very nice, robust network polymer with very well controlled size. In this case, in the, in, it's in the micron size range. Okay. If both of the linkers are made of this molecule, then you can make very interesting morphology. And lastly, if the build up, uh, building block imidazole has chirality, then you end up making a chiral polymer. Okay? So this was very exciting because it was never made into a polymeric particle for these carbenes. And here we see that we can control the particle size by introducing a terminating group. So instead of a micron size particles, now we can make nanoparticles. Okay? So we start out by making a polyimidazolium, which is in the form of an ionic solid particle instead of ionic liquid. And then when we in reduce it, we can make it into a polycarbene particle. And then when we introduce the metals, it can turn out to be a metal organometallic polymeric particle. Okay? So we end up making three classes of material by using this chemistry. And we can see that the particle size and shape really doesn't change in this process. Okay? Using these particles, we can then do a lot of interesting chemistry with it. For example, Suzuki coupling reaction is one of the most versatile reactions. We can combine an aerial halide and a phenylboronic acid to make molecules like this for various pharmaceutical and petrochemical applications. Now, if you have a palladium polycarbene particle, we end up making one of the most powerful heterogeneous Suzuki coupling catalysts. We work with very high yield with both aerial aldides and bromides, and you also can make it for aerial chlorides. Okay. In addition, we can use this kind of poly, uh, polymeric particles to do biomass conversion. For example, we can convert fructose and glucose into HMF, which is a good precursor for plastic and petrochemicals. Okay. We were able to achieve 95% yield from fructose conversion and more than 85% percent yield from glucose. This is much higher than what people have previously reported in a leading scientific journal. They were able to achieve only 83 and 68 percent conversion of these two molecules. Okay. In addition, we were able to get pure products at fairly low temperatures. In the, in, on top of these different applications, we can also use this carbene catalyst to do a conversion of greenhouse gas. I think all of you will agree when you live in tropical countries like this one, the weather as it gets warmer and warmer due to global warming becomes really quite unbearable. What if we can actually not only store the CO2 but convert it into something useful? That will be, uh, that will be very, very helpful. Um, what people currently are trying to do with uh, CO2 is to convert it um, with this hydrocylation reaction. Okay? The kind of catalyst they use is this very expensive organometallic complex that involves ruthenium metal. Okay? You can see that the catalyst, although it works, it's not very efficient. Okay? It also works under fairly harsh conditions, fairly high pressures, and the worst part is the organometallic catalysts are sensitive to the presence of oxygen. And you know, wherever there's CO2, there's always oxygen. It's going to be very expensive to remove oxygen for uh, before you use it, right? So this is a major drawback for conventional catalysts. We develop an organocarbene catalyst that actually allow us to directly convert CO2 to methanol using a silane, okay? So this is very exciting. We use an organocatalyst that is illustrated here, and it works at room temperature and pressure, giving you very high yield in just four hours. 
In particular, it doesn't involve any expensive metals and it is not sensitive to oxygen. So it is a very nice um, catalyst and we can form it in the form of polycarbene catalyst so that it can be easily recycled and reused. Now, in the process of developing this material as a catalyst, we discovered that it can also be used for biomedical applications. Many of you have heard of the widespread use of broad-spectrum antibiotics. Okay? That basically caused people to have uh, um, bacterial infection, and these bacterial infections end up becoming superbugs because the bacteria becomes antibiotic resistant. So in the hospital, there are a lot of problems because um, people will transmit MRSA, which is a deadly skin disease. And also, people suffer from bacterial formation on top of implanted devices and facilities called biofilms. Okay? So for people going to the hospital, very often they pick up this kind of infection and end up having to spend a lot more money staying in the hospital. And the treatment cost for people suffering from bacterial infection is more than $40 billion uh, every year. Okay? On top of that, there's also a huge global market in consumer care um, using antimicrobial agents. Okay? Because of the lack of development uh, in antibiotics, FDA has actually offered to fast track new antibiotics. What we want to do is to move away from designing new antibiotics. We want to create polymeric antimicrobial agents that will not have drug resistance problem. Okay? So we make use of our polycarbenes because these polycarbenes can be generated in the form of polyimidazoles with positive charge in the backbone. This positive charge can interact with the negatively charged membranes on the surface of fungus and bacteria. Okay? We have created this class of polyimidazole as antimicrobial agent by engineering the charge distribution as, as well as other new polymeric materials. For example, in this case, we try to use the polyimidazole salt to destroy the Niger membrane. This is a very important um, fungus, okay? And what we see is that when the polymer is introduced to the fungus, it latches on to the membrane because of charge interaction, and then it pierces a hole on the membrane, and as a result, the content of the fungus leak out. So you kill the fungus without allowing it to develop any drug resistance. Okay? We then use this to treat fungus, um, fungal keratitis. This is one of the leading cause for blindness. Okay? You can see if you don't treat it, basically the fungus will invade into the cornea. This is the black dots that you see here. Now, if you use the leading drug for treating uh, fungal keratitis, such as the fluconazole, you might relieve some of this, but you can still see a lot of this uh, fungus invasion into the cornea. On the other hand, if you use our polyimidazole, basically you eliminated a lot of this uh, fungus um, that has invaded the cornea. Okay? So on top of being more effective than the best conventional drug, it also is much less expensive. In addition, this polymer can be easily stored and has a very long shelf life, unlike the fluconazole that has to be refrigerated and has a limited shelf life. So with these antimicrobial agents that we have developed, a few years ago, our antimicrobial agents were named as one of the 10 world-changing ideas by the Scientific American. And we have developed basically broad spectrum activity against gram positive as well as gram negative bacteria and fungus without basically allowing the drug resistance to develop. Okay? The materials that we have developed also are non toxic, they can be biodegradable and therefore eco friendly. So they can be made into cream and hydrogel, and we hope that you will replace things like tricoslin, which is now banned in many countries. Um, in the use of consumer care. On top of that, we can use it to cope as a, to, as a way to prevent the biofilm from developing on the surface of various implants. They are low cost and scalable. We're working on developing this material for anti-TB and anti-MRSA. And the lower hanging fruit is to work with companies like P&G to develop them as disinfectants 
preservative in personal care products. In the last year, we have actually spun off two companies. One of them is Austro Nanotech. We are in the process of developing various antimicrobial agents that will allow us to market it and commercialize it uh, by scaling them up successfully. Now I want to move into a different type of biomedical applications, which involves delivering of drugs, in particular for cancer patients. Okay? Many of you probably hear of drug delivery systems. They allow you to carry the drugs into the body in such a way that hopefully you can target the specific organs that you're trying to deliver them to. But typically they have no therapeutic effect and they definitely need to be minimized in the amount that is used. So they're usually biodegradable polymers. What we are interested in is to develop a drug carrier that actually has therapeutic effect. And therefore, you don't need to worry about how much is being used, and hopefully, better still, you have a synergistic effect between this carrier and the drug. Okay. So in East Asia, many people like to drink green tea. Okay. Green tea has this major ingredient called catechin. This material called EGCG is actually very useful because it is anti-cancer, antioxidant, anti-inflammatory, and antimicrobial. Okay? And guess what? It's also anti-aging. Okay? So this thing, this material, we want to turn it into a drug carrier. Okay? It has a very high binding affinity to um, protein because of the pi pi stacking interaction between EGCG and the amino acids with ring structure with protein. Okay. So we can try to formulate this EGCG into a micellar nanocomplex to contain drugs. What we first have to do is we turn it into a ligamer, and we also um, combine a dimer of EGCG with a polyethylene glycol. Okay. So when you want to deliver a therapeutic protein, what you first have to do is to wrap it into an oligomeric EGCG. This oligomer is designed because it has greater inhibition of cancer cell growth than monomers of EGCG. Okay. It also binds with the protein and stabilizes the micelle formation. Okay. The second part is a pegylated EGCG. It will form the shell of the micelle so that it will allow this drug to be in circulation inside the body for a long time and then target uh, the cancerous tumor. Okay? So first you add the therapeutic protein to the oligomer EGCG. And then you introduce the pegylated EGCG as the shell. Together, this micellar nanocomplex is less than 200 nanometer in dimension. And because of the size, it allows the material to be accumulated at the leaky vasculature that is associated with the tumor. This is how it allows us to have a passive targeting of the drug to the tumor sites. Okay. So using this material, we can carry a variety of therapeutic protein. Here I want to just give you one example. Breast cancer is actually has a very high incidence rate, and one of the most common uh, breast cancer has the overexpression of HER2. Herceptin is then developed to target this HER2 overexpress breast cancer cells. Okay? So when you introduce a HER2 overexpress cancer cells, notice how overnight Herceptin will kill 40% of it. By using Herceptin in our green tea micellar nanocomplex, you can kill even more of these uh, cancerous cells. You can kill more than 60% of it. Okay? So that's definitely a synergistic effect. Now, if you introduce the normal breast cells, notice how the Herceptin and the Herceptin uh, green tea micellar complex will not kill the normal cells. So this is very important. You will only target the breast cancer cells. You will leave alone the normal cells. Okay? So this will be very attractive. Be basically, it will minimize the side effects. Okay? So then we study how a xenograft mice with breast cancer tumor will be treated by the use of Herceptin. If you don't treat it, notice how the tumor size will grow five times after just one month, 35 days. Okay? If you introduce Herceptin by itself, shown in yellow, 
the growth will not be as fast, but still the tumor will grow three times as much after one month. Okay? If you use our Herceptin encapsulated in the green tea micellar complex, instead of growing, it will actually reduce the tumor size and keep it small over the period of time. So this is very exciting. It's retarding the tumor growth in vivo and induce the cell death in the tumor. Okay. It also shows that our green tea micellar complex greatly enhance the anti-cancer efficacy of Herceptin by itself. So using this technology, we want to know why it works so well. So we looked at the biodistribution of the drug in the mice. Okay. So if you look at Herceptin by itself, shown in gray, notice how Herceptin is not only in the tumor, actually more of it is accumulated in kidney and liver. This is why a lot of drugs actually, although it cure, help to cure certain diseases, it actually presents a lot of damages to various organs. Okay? On the other hand, if you introduce Herceptin in the green tea micellar complex, shown in green, notice how instead of accumulating at the various organs, most of it is in the tumor. So this is exactly what you want, and we are able to successfully target the tumor with this delivery system. Okay? Besides accumulating at the tumor sites, it penetrated the tumor sites with the histology data. And another part is it allows us to keep the Herceptin, the therapy, inside the body for extended period of time. So this therapeutic protein is very expensive. You want it to be circulating inside the body for a long period of time and go to the right organ, which is the tumor site. Notice how we were able to increase the half-life of the blood circulation of Herceptin by 30 times by using this green tea micellar complex. Okay. Now we're very encouraged by this result, so we want to see besides introducing therapeutic protein, would it also work on various small and large molecule drugs? So we introduced sutininib into this green tea micellar complex. Those of you familiar with this drug will know that it is one of the very few drugs that actually work for renal cancer. It also works for gastrointestinal or pancreatic cancer. But the problem is it is very expensive. We're talking about more than 7,000 US dollars a month, and you have to administer this drug every day in order for it to be effective. And the worst part also is that you have a lot of severe side effects. Okay? So when we looked at a renal cancer uh, tumor xenografted mice, Notice how if you don't introduce any drug, which is a control, okay, the tumor will grow very rapidly after 10 weeks. Okay? If you introduce sutinidib by itself, it will not grow as fast, but it will still grow. Okay? On the other hand, if you introduce sutinidib in our green tea micellar complex shown in black, instead of growing, it suppresses the growth and it still works even after five weeks when we stop introducing the drug. Okay? So this is very encouraging results. We are able to show better therapeutic effect than the conventional sutininib administration, and we were able to achieve this excellent result by administering less drugs, seven milligram per kilogram instead of 60, and administering it less frequently, twice per week instead of daily. Okay, so this means that you can save a lot of costs with the drug, and you don't have to go and see the doctor as frequently, and in addition, you will have much less side effects. Okay? So this is uh, the type of work that we are very excited about. Um, a year ago, we set up a spin-off company called Green Tea Biomed, and we are almost finished raising $5 million to try to bring this, um, this um, green tea micellar complex into the market but first, we have to manufacture it into large scale and do various large animal studies. Okay. Now I'd like to shift gear a little bit. I noticed there are also uh, some students from the biotech area besides engineering area. What we are trying to do also is to develop material for cell culture technology. And as you know, in industrial biotechnology, you're trying to produce various different things, therapeutic proteins like what I mentioned earlier, like Herceptin, gene therapy, you can use them and also for cell therapy and tissue engineering regenerative medicine. Okay. Unfortunately, unlike 
chemical engineering and chemical systems where we are able to generate large amount of chemicals in tons of chemicals with a chemical reactor. For cell culture technology, the bioreactors basically are limited in scale even at the industrial level to only about 500 to 1,000 liter. Okay, so these are very small scale reactor for a chemical engineer. And the reason is it's very difficult to scale up these systems while maintaining the cell characteristics. So for example, you want to maintain the cell viability while you scale it up. You want to maintain the cell metabolism. And if there are stem cells, you want to make sure they kept their stemness. Okay? So what we are trying to do is to develop microcarriers for large scale synthesis and also for basically uh, research applications, we want to develop cell culture substrates. Okay? Cell culture substrates are typically used to coat cell and tissue culture supplies. Okay? They allow the cells then to attach onto these supplies and grow nicely. Okay? So there's a huge global market for this. And currently, the kind of things that people use as a substrate are not suitable for producing the large cell numbers needed for clinical or industrial applications. Okay? So for example, one of the most commonly used coating material is this matrix gel that I've shown here. It is coming from the extracellular matrix of a tumor inside a small animal like mice or rats. Okay? So you can imagine it is very expensive. We're talking about basically uh, 50 cents per six well plate as a thin coating. Okay? And the worst part is it has immunogenic issues, okay, because it comes from an animal. Okay. Now, what we are trying to do is to produce synthetic cell culture substrates. If you look at what people are doing now, like cloning, they use Syntamax, which is a peptide-based material. So it has no animal origin. Okay. It has no immunogenic issues, therefore. However, it is even more extensive than matrix gel. Our goal is to make materials that really inexpensive, pathogen-free, non-immunogenic, and biocompatible. And we believe we should do it using a polymeric material. Okay? Our material is much less than five cents. Okay? It will allow us to maintain the cell pluripotency and viability. Okay? So we tested many, many different materials to develop these cell culture substrates. And the key here is we found that the cells were attached well to aiming rich and positively charged nanoparticles. So this is key. If you make these materials with this kind of surface chemistry, the cells will attach very well up to them. And then secondly, we wanted to make them into a nanoparticle using a reverse microemulsion. I will illustrate why this is important. Okay. Are there biologists here? No biologists here. But if you know a biologist, they love to use the same protocol that they know works. They don't want to change it. So in this case, if they want to do a coating, they want to use material like matrix gel, which is stored in a refrigerator and pour out, become a liquid. Okay? So how to make a coating easily? We can't teach the biologists how to do polymerization. Right? So what we did is we make these nanoparticles, which can be introduced into water to make a very nice suspension and then make coating. The coating will make a monolayer coating that's transparent, and after cells grow on them, it will become this opaque um, confluent layer on the, on the cell culture material, uh, cover slip. Okay? So we did this for induced pluripotent stem cells. We did 10 passages, and then we can still see the markers associated with pluripotent stem cells, such as nano, ox3, etc. So it maintained the stemness of the cell. And then we were not happy with that. We continue to do 25 passages. Okay? So to just give you a sense, you can get a really nice publication in a top journal with just five passages. But because we want to make something that really can be commercialized, we did 25 passages. Okay? So in this case, what we see is if you use Syntamax, the peptide material from Corning, after 25 passages, you lose quite a lot of the stemness. Instead of 100%, now they become 79 to 61 percent. If you use matrix gel, depending on what markers, you lose uh, 2 percent up to 25 percent of the stemness. But if you use our material, which was developed uh, by the scientist Nan Nan Nan, so it's, you can see he has tried many, many different materials. This is NE78. But this material, 
basically tap essentially all the stemless marker, okay, after 25 passages. So we have a material that has better yield, has no animal origin, and it is very, very inexpensive. So we are very excited about this material and we really hope to commercialize it in the near future. Once you develop these materials to do cell culture, you can use it for many applications. I mentioned cell therapy, regenerating medicine. But very dear to our heart at IBN is the recent development of in vitro toxicology. Okay? You're all familiar with testing medicine and drugs for toxicity before you use them, before they're clinically approved. But there are many things around us in our daily life that actually could cause toxicity. For example, cosmetics, food additives, healthcare products. Right? Now a lot of countries uh, have banned the use of using animals for testing, for example, cosmetics in Europe. Right? But uh, we don't have very good system to test um, these different things. Okay? Now why is it important to test this uh, drugs, etc. For example, drug-induced liver injury is actually the leading cause for kidney failure. Okay? And then you, one will need to have an organ transplantation because the artificial kidney, artificial liver doesn't work so well. Right? Now, a lot of people, a lot of older people are afraid to go to hospital and it's for a good reason. Did you know that about 5% of people who are hospitalized develop kidney injury? These are very scary statistics. Okay? How do people test for toxicity? They usually use animals. Okay? It is a current gold standard of toxicity, and yet the predictability is only about 60%. That means it's not, better, not much better than a coin flip. Okay? So in this, process, in this process, you use something like animals, you sacrifice a lot of animals, Okay, you don't get actually very good predictability. It's very expensive. And then you think the, the drug is safe. You bring it to preclinical and clinical trial, and then bam, you realize that actually it's toxic to human. Okay? And this is one of the reasons why development of drugs are so expensive. Okay? What we are trying to do is to use human primary cells. Human primary cells basically will not have interspecies variability. Um, the issue, however, is that if you look at what people do in vitro toxicity, they usually do this very laborious method with single cell types, okay, with a static cell culture. And what happens is they don't get very good predictability and they need to go to very high concentration or dosage of the medicine before they see the toxicity effect. Okay? And this is why it's not used so frequently. Okay? What we have done is to use miniaturized bioreactors for in vitro toxicity studies. So we will first basically fill these different channels, coat it with synthetic cell culture substrates, so stem cells grow very well in them, and then we can differentiate them into different cell types. For example, we can differentiate them into proximal tubule cells, like what you have in the kidney. Now, they grow very well in these reactors, okay, with the right shear stress that is in the system. It allows us to have what is called perfusion studies. So notice how in these microfluidic systems, the kidney tubule cells grow very nicely, tightly. We call them, uh, they form these tight junctions, okay, so that only water can permeate through it, but proteins cannot leak out through it. This is exactly what we want in a good functioning kidney. It is better than the typical standard static culture in a tissue culture polystyrene plate. Okay? Now, if you introduce a drug like gentamicin, which is one of the few drugs that work for sepsis, which is a deadly blood infection, okay? there are not many good drugs. Sepsis is one of them, but it's known to be nephrotoxic. Okay? Notice how if you use a tissue culture polystyrene static culture, you can see, certainly, the number of cells decrease, right? Because some of the cells were killed by this material, okay? But you don't need to be very good with your eyes to realize by our microfluidic systems that this material is nephrotoxic, okay? So this is very exciting because using physiologically meaningful dosage of gentamicin 
we can easily see in our miniaturized device that this material is nephrotoxic, okay? Very conclusive. We did this type of studies for many different drugs, and we successfully predict with these in vitro systems, just using human primary cells, what will happen in human, in vivo toxicity, okay? With an accuracy of 85 to 90 percent. So this is much better than the 60 percent that you get from animal studies, okay? Without sacrificing animals' life, it is much less expensive, much less laborious. Using our miniaturized device, you also save a lot of cells and reagents. Okay? We are now testing this kind of approach with multiple cell types. Besides kidney cells, we are looking at lung, heart, liver, pancreatic cells to test the toxicity of various organs simultaneously in this uh, body-on-chip type of device. What is different in our system is that we are able to do it and validate many drugs, unlike a lot of work that has only that validated one or two drugs. Okay? We are also trying to make it into a high throughput drug screening because that's what the pharmaceutical companies want. They want to be able to test many drug candidates simultaneously under different concentration and dosage. Okay? Very recently, we're very excited about setting up a company called CellBay to do this kind of work, to do control delivery, uh, sorry, control differentiation of cells and then using this kind of in vitro toxicity studies to predict uh, what will happen to various drugs as well as environmental pollutants such as haze, okay, as well as various chemicals we use in food additives and consumer care and cosmetics. Now the last one uh, that I would like to describe involves developing nanotechnology for diagnostic application. And of course, this Zika virus is very dear to our heart. Besides the outbreak last year, I don't know about Malaysia, but Singapore still have sporadic cases of Zika, okay? What it is is a single-stranded RNA flavivirus spread by mosquitoes. And the recent outbreak actually was noted in 48 countries, including Singapore and Malaysia. Now, this infection has links with neurological defects. So, because it can be transmitted from mother to a fetus, this created quite a panic, right? What we would like to do is to go beyond the conventional diagnosis, which is polymerase chain reaction or ELISA. Both methods require hours, several hours before you can diagnose um, Zika, okay? So obviously that is slow and expensive and it's not gonna work very well, um, not, in practic not practical, as a large-scale early screening tool. Okay? What we would like to do is to actually develop a point-of-care test for Zika that is rapid, selective, portable, and inexpensive. Okay? Now, many of you know that Zika only last year, but actually has been around. Okay? But very often, it is not detected because it's asymptomatic. So this is a bit disconcerting because you might be carrying that virus and then you're getting pregnant and you don't even know it. So one thing you want to be able to screen it, another thing you might want to develop it as like a prenatal test, right? So what we hope to do is to make use of NS1 as a protein that is secreted extracellularly by Zika virus as a way to screen things, okay? Now, what we have done here is a lateral flow paper-based assay that shows that how you can bind Zika virus with antibody to form this sandwich structure. This sandwich structure will basically create a spot on the paper. So you have a control spot and your test spot. If your test result is negative, you will only see the control spot and not the test spot, okay? So it's like the pregnancy test, right? You can go, I'm sure Malaysia also have a lot of Watson, right? You can go to Watson, buy this for $20, you can test it at home, right? And in 10 minutes, you can have the result. So what we have done is we have developed our own antibodies for Zika and S1. Uh, we look at eight different cones, and then we have 64 combination of detector and capture antibody screen. And we selected three pairs of uh, antibodies, and you can see that they have remarkably excellent sensitivity. Five nanogram per mil for Zika and S1 is serum. Now, the important thing is Zika ferrovirus is very similar to other types of mosquito-transmitted viruses, for example, dengue, okay? So 
what we see here is our Zika test is very selective and sensitive for Zika, but it will not give you false positive for all the other uh, viruses shown here. So this is very encouraging, it is very selective and specific. And then what we wanted to do is we wanted to help those people who are afraid of needles. A while ago, my daughter who is sitting over there had a high fever, so we went to see the doctor. And the doctor had a paper-based test for dengue, right? But it takes a lot of uh, blood to do the very complicated sample preparation that's needed. So he took out one whole tube of blood. Okay, so obviously this is not something that you can do at home. Okay, so we thought about developing tests that will work with urine and saliva. Okay, so NS1 is known definitely to work in urine, for example. And what we want to do is to also test for saliva. Nobody will mind giving you some saliva or urine to test, right? Okay, I'm almost finishing. But the key here is saliva contains proteinaceous substances. So they will basically aggregate with the nanoparticles, the gold nanoparticles, and then they will smudge the whole paper base assay. So it will not give you a clear result. So what we had to do is to engineer a very different paper base device where the sample saliva goes through the sample pot, flows into the sample pad, and get filtered out with these proteinaceous substances before it meets the nanoparticles in the reagent pot flowing through the reagent pad. Okay? So you remove and filter out the proteinaceous substances before it gives you the test result. Okay? So by this method, we were able to get very clear results, not only from blood sample, but also from saliva and urine samples. Okay? We were able to get very high sensitive by both uh, the stacking flow and lateral flow for saliva and blood. And then with urine, we notice that it is not quite as sensitive, so we are trying to develop a better antibody for this. And this is basically because a urine has a slightly lower pH. And at that lower pH, there's a conformation of change in the Zika envelope protein. So we need to screen the antibody actually under those conditions in order to get the same sensitivity. But I should say this kind of sensitivity is very, very good because um, it is much lower than what you would be expecting. Okay? Now, the test strips also can be developed in such a way that we can detect many different viruses at the same time. So for example, Zika and Dengue is transmitted by the same type of mosquito. They are uh, found, this kind of infection are found with similar symptoms in the same type of regions, so it's important to basically be able to differentiate them. So what we did is we used two different nanoparticles, a blue gold nanoparticle that is branched and slightly bigger versus the red nanoparticle that is spherical. Okay? So the red one we use for Zika and the blue one for Dengue. And of course, they have their own unique Zika and Dengue capture and detector antibody. Okay? So if you have just Zika, the spots, the test spots will be red. If you have dengue, then the test spots will be blue. If you have both, if you are really unlucky, you have both, then you'll be purple. And then obviously if you have none, you won't see any test spots. So this kind of image analysis can actually be very easily done with now a cell phone type of apps. Okay? If you're colorblind, if you tell me you're blue, red, colorblind, you can just easily use this. So what we have done here is a rapid detection of Zika NS1 achieved with very excellent sensitivity and it's also specific to Zika. It is inexpensive and is very um, we can, well, I sh should not show this number because when we start selling it, it will be more expensive. <laughs> but basically it's low cost, right? You can afford it. Okay. Um, it will help us manage the spread of Zika and uh, they are easily modified. Uh, to be able to accommodate different kinds of samples. So you can use non-invasive samples like uh, uh, saliva and urine beside blood. Okay? You can easily detect Zika and Dengue and differentiate them. Okay? So we are in the process of spinning off this company called Paper Bay, and we're very excited about this new technology. Okay? So last but not least, I'll uh, just show you what we are trying to do here. We are using the paper-based assays to develop not only infectious diseases involving mosquitoes, we are looking at dengue, sexually transmitted diseases, uh, we are looking at metabolic syndromes, fertility tests, kidney liver functions. All this involves detecting proteins or small molecules. 
And we are also interested in detecting nuclear acids. Now, these are very challenging, actually, for paper-based assays. You require some sample preparation, okay? But it will be very useful. Now we are very worried all the time about food pathogens, contamination, okay? And GMO is also an issue with food. Um, and certainly, we want to be able to differentiate different kinds of meat, right? A while ago, you remember, people are worried about horse meat being uh, trying to be substitutes for beef. This is because horse meat, especially raising horses, they're injected with certain uh, drugs that really are toxic, okay? And this country, obviously, people are interested in making sure something is halal, right? And lastly, um, a lot of pet diseases. If you can detect it easily and inexpensively, that will be very attractive, and all this involves using paper-based assays now to do DNA sequences, which really hasn't been done very much. Okay? So last but not least, I just summarize. I hope you have given you a sense of what we are trying to do with these nanomaterials and systems. You can develop them for a variety of applications, from energy applications to biomedical applications shown here, are drug delivery, nanomedicine, drug screening, in vitro toxicology, we're also looking at cell culture substrates. I didn't go into de de detail, but we looked at tissue engineering and defiling coatings, and we're certainly interested in all kinds of diagnostics, ELISA cell assays, um, paper-based assays, as well as cancer diagnostics, and also food testing. Okay. Last but not least, I'd like to thank the students and staff who have worked with me on these various projects. In particular, I should mention Ju Yung Chung for the work on the micellar nano complex, Nan 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 for the work on the uh, synthetic cell culture substrates, and Si Ming who is uh, sitting there. She is the, uh, our young student who has been working on the Zika test kits. Okay, so there are many opportunities also to come to our institute to do uh, research attachments, so I welcome the students to apply for that. We are grateful for the funding of IBN, which comes from the Biomedical Research Council under the Agency for Science, Technology and Research in Singapore. And last but not least, let me invite you to our conference that will be coming up in Hawaii in this December. And uh, this Nano Today conference um, takes place every other year. The abstracts uh, for oral has been closed, but we're still um, welcoming submission for posters. And um, we're grateful for many of you who might be readers as well as contributors to our journal, which has the latest impact factor of 17. I take the opportunity to thank my managing editor, Norina, who is sitting over there, uh, for all her support. And thank you very much for attention. Thank you, Prof. Ying, for your inspiring uh, lecture. Uh, I think it's particularly amazing uh, that uh, Prof. Ying is able to, uh, to apply nanotechnology in different fields of applications. Yeah, we can see, I think, uh, there's applications uh, from energy uh, storage uh, to medicine, and uh, from CO2 reduction uh, to biotechnology. And I think it's even more amazing that uh, she seems to be able to do well in many of them. Yeah. Um, so uh, now we should uh, proceed to the uh, Q&A uh, session. So uh, Prof. Ying, could you please uh, join me you know, at the sofa yeah, for the Q&A session? So now I would like to uh, open up the floor for questions. Any questions? P perhaps uh, I should start the ball rolling by asking sure. the two simple questions. Yes. Yeah. So uh, no pressure. <laughs> All right. Uh, the first question for me is that, uh, uh, Prof. Ying, what, what do you think is the single most uh, important uh, challenge yeah, in uh, nano uh, science and nanotechnology? Mm -hmm. That's the first question. Yes. yes. Do you want to answer first? Or? Yes, maybe I answer okay, first. Sure. Yeah. So I think actually um, for nano science and technology, because there's so much hype, yeah, it is very important to make sure that it actually fulfill its promise through the different applications. So for the journal, for example, we really focus on developing new synthesis technique approaches that, and focusing on applications. I think the applications, ultimately, as an engineer, um, is the most exciting, and maybe also for all researchers. Right? It's very important to recognize there's a lot of basic research 
they need to be done. Okay, but even more important is always at the back of the researcher's mind that they know what is the ultimate goal of why people fund our research. They want to see um, real applications developing. So while it's nice to have nice papers um, published, but we always are mindful to make sure that the approach is really practical. Because if it's not practical, it is very difficult to be uh, turned into a commercial industrial application. So asking the right question, and in our case, is always what problems need to be addressed is most critical. Very good answer. I think uh, chemical engineers always do practical things. Yes. That's what we are trained <laughs> for. How we are trained for. Right. Uh, okay, my second question is actually uh, related to you being uh, multi-talented or multi-talented. Yeah, so can you please share with us you know, your secret uh, <laughs> of becoming a successful you know, scientist, leader, and entrepreneur you know, all at the same time? My family sitting there will tell you actually not much talent is involved. It's actually a lot of hard work. It's really a lot of hard work. Uh, so be able to put in uh, the time um, and persistently and persevere is really key for any researcher. And I think for young people who are interested in pursuing research, keep in mind that science and engineering is, if you want to be good at doing it, it's kind of like uh, training to be a top-notch musician or athlete. Okay, you do it many, many times before you're good at it, and then you realize the tricks about how to do it right. And then you realize, oh, I can do it this way. Um, you will give me this type of approach and this type of results. And then you realize all the shortcuts and you develop an intuition on how to do it right. And the other thing would be, I think uh, Monash is also a very special place. You have many good departments and different schools in one place, right? Um, including medicine, right? So this is very important because a lot of exciting things happen at interface between disciplines. So one thing that we did um, in this institute is that we are very fortunate to be able to hire very well um, excellent scientists, chemists, biologists, material scientists, physicists, um, and also bioinformatics people along with chemical, biological, electrical, mechanical engineers as well as medical doctors in one place. And that allows us to tackle very difficult and challenging problems, which cannot be done in one single group. So I would like to encourage the young people to take classes in different departments and schools, if possible, if you have lots of room to take electives, and to do research uh, with different professors. Then you will learn many different things. Okay, well done. Yeah, all the PhD students here. Yeah, I've heard uh, your voice. Can I ask a question? Yeah, sure. Yes. yes. Um, okay, you are talking about different multidisciplinary uh, from catalyst, for, uh, developing a catalyst, developing a, a, um, a basket biology uh, kind of thing. How actually you bring all the scientists together under one roof that working on the, on the simple kit that will basically help the whole, the whole world. <laughs> um, years of hard work and experience, because I think he kind of revealed my age when he talked about <laughs> <laughs> not as young as not, not intentionally. Uh, yeah. So so yeah. You you, I started off as a chemical engineer, but my postdoc was in material physics. Okay, and then I moved into different areas like biomedical engineering. So I was. I think in my early 30s before I started working on bioengineering. Um, and since then I have been doing different things. I say one thing that I do is um, I get bored. Because if you spend enormous amount of time doing something and you become very good at it, you get a bit bored. Okay? But that doesn't mean you stop doing research. It just means that you stop working in that particular area. It doesn't mean you give it up. It just means I'm going to do a new project, okay? Because very often you started a field and then you might move on to a different field, okay? After many people go into the area, and then you come up with new questions, new problems, new approaches, okay? And then you might realize, hey, this thing that I want to tackle, 
um, I can make use of something that I did before. So what I did before becomes my little toolbox, my nano toolbox. So many things are in my toolbox. If somebody asked me to help tackle a certain problem or I found something interesting to work on, I would look into my toolbox to see whether I have the right thing, right approach to tackle it. If I don't, then I must go and create another one. So this is something that um, if you have the luxury to do, will be a lot of fun and always make uh, your job very, very exciting. I, I'm not trying to put down people who work in very specific fields for the entire life, but I'm just not one of those people. <laughs> I like uh, to choose different problems. And so if Zika comes up, I must work on Zika, right? Yeah. So we must work on things that have a great impact. This is our interest. All right. Um, Dr. Puli. Thank you for, for a very interesting talk. Uh, my question is, uh, when do you decide to go for a patent, to go for a spin-off, or to share your research outputs with the company, uh, or scale up? When is that? And how do you do that? <laughs> okay. Thank you. If, if you want, um, I think it starts with the problem, right? Engineers like to solve problems. So you first come up with an exciting problem that you want to tackle. I give you an example that I was talking with Professor Guo just now. One of our early projects, my, one of my first projects involved developing, a, in the biomedical area, involves developing a glucose responsive drug delivery system. Okay. If you have such a system, we thought it would be perfect because right now the diabetic patients have to poke their fingertips to draw blood, to test blood sugar level, and then they have to inject themselves with insulin. So you can imagine it's met with very poor patient compliance and you have all this fluctuation in blood sugar level before and after the injection. Okay? So we thought, why not we make a nanoparticle that is sensitive to the glucose level. It will encapsulate the insulin and it will deliver insulin only when the blood sugar level is high. And we formulate it into something that you can take orally or by nasal passage so you don't have to inject it. So this was the problem statement and our approach it all sounds wonderful, right? You can tackle one of the most important problems. Uh, by the way, insulin is, uh, takes up about one third of the entire drug market. Okay, so it's a very important, uh, important drug. Okay. So we started doing this uh, with one PhD student towards the end of his thesis. Okay, and we found some good preliminary results, and then I started with a new PhD student. But he was really struggling. It was a very challenging project. Okay, and then in the process, he he was uh, not doing a good enough job to really complete it. And then a third student came in, and then he, he started doing this project and take it on. By the time the third student uh, finished the PhD, it was about five and a half years after when we first got the idea, okay? W results were great, the PhD thesis was done, we filed the patent, okay? We spin off a company right after that, okay? Um, he won a top prize in the 50K competition at MIT, which is an entrepreneur contest. You write a business plan based on your research, okay? And then a lot of VCs, venture capitalists, were interested in investing in this company. So we get to pick and choose. In the end, we chose uh, angels instead of VCs because they were not as greedy about the shares they would take up in the company. <laughs> then the founders can keep more of their shares, right? So that was 2004. Four, okay, 2003, 2004, we found the company. In 2010, the company entered preclinical trials. Okay, so after all the hard work with large animal studies, um, two pharmaceutical companies in the States wanted to buy it. In the end, Merck bought it, doubled the bid and bought it for 500 million US dollars. Okay, so this is the type of things that I'm trying to say. It involves actually three PhD students but mainly the effort of one, okay? And then it involves seven years after the thesis. We were very lucky to bring the preclinical trials very quickly, okay? And involves just one patent, right? But of course, after that, the company has found a number of other patents, okay? If you found a good project, dressing a good problem, and you have a great creative, innovative approach, then you have the formulation of a great thesis, great research, and a great patent. 
Okay, with a great pattern, then you can actually set up a great business, provided that you have the right people working with you in a business. Robin, I'll uh, ask a technical question. Yes. Right, in the uh, lithium battery project, you make use of hybrid method which combine the uh, bad chemistry and solid method to enhance the uh, capacity. But what about other parameters, like for example, the discharge rate as well as the voltage supply? Like for example, mm. some of the uh, new materials, they can go up to more than five volts. So in this aspect, actually, what? what sure, sure. I think some of that is in the, in the work that we have published in uh, advanced materials. Yeah, so those are ab absolutely important questions. So a lot of that involves uh, fine-tuning the material, doping the material, and further testing the material. And long-term stability is also very important. Yes. I'm sure you know her, Sangeeta Bhatia. Yeah. She uh, created mini uh, levers. Levers. And then she used the uh, mini levers to test it. How do you compare your method to her method, the yeah. pros and cons? There, there are definitely groups at MIT and Harvard that are doing very nice work. Um, ours is a kidney model, and um, I think our bioreactor has its uh, very um, unique strength with the perfusion and the shear stress control in this system that allow the cells that are very sensitive to such things to grow very well. And what has been published out there for kidney actually is very limited. There's more work done in liver. Um, for kidney, basically ours, basically I think is state of the art. And we have not only validated a lot of work out there with different uh, organs, including kidney, liver, etc. They usually just validate it with one or two drugs. We have tested now more than 100 drugs, and we're also testing all kinds of environmental pollutants and chemicals, okay? And we can predict what is the outcome in vivo with 85, 90% predictability. So that is very, very good. Any more questions? Yes. Hi. Uh, I'll ask you something from a, a early career researcher's point of view. Yes. How to get started in writing good journal publications, or what do you look for in a great publication? Thank you. As an editor, we spend a lot of time on the journals, submissions. Um, but one thing um, and that is very important is if you want to get into a high impact journal, your work must be something that is very novel, innovative. Okay? We publish a lot of review articles and for that we're looking for not only very interesting review articles that not just cover something comprehensively but very selectively cover the most important aspect of something that has not been covered before and also the perspective. What is your perspective for future work? What is needed? What is the type of research that is needed? That's for review article. If you're looking at uh, original articles in the form of rapid communications or full-length article, the editors are always looking for the novelty of what you're doing, okay? It would take just five, 10 minutes, honestly, to just see oh, this is a reinvention of will or incremental work is so, is a, actually, to be honest, it's a very quick decision for the editor. So the editor himself or herself has to read very broadly and then they will know what is the state of the art, okay? And then they look very carefully at your abstract. It's very important that young people learn how to write an abstract that illustrate why they do that project and what is the impact of their work, okay? And to do high quality uh, graphics for the figure, okay? Figures that doesn't have good statistical analysis, don't have very careful um, um, detailed uh, schematics, good illustration of tables, okay? Um, or the type of data that's in there. Okay, give you an example, a lot of routine data need to be in the supporting information instead of 
in the main paper. The main paper really should have exciting data results. Okay. So if you go to the top journals, I really encourage young people to do this. You must read a lot of good papers um, and then be able to be critical. Okay, so then you can learn from that process. Uh, one, one more question over here. Yeah. Yes. Uh, my question is all about fermentation. Since you have been working in terms of developing the you know, uh, fermentation substrate to produce proteins, on the other hand, there are uh, areas where they produce protein without cell-free systems. And the other way, the cell-free protein systems. So my, my question over here is, how close are we to produce a protein without fermenters, or without mammalian systems? I'm not in that area. I'm okay. really not in that area. I mean, we make use of proteins, we encapsulate them for a delivery system, etc. but we are, we are really not in the fermentation business. Not, not our research. I'm not in bio. I'm not in that. Okay? We are in a lot of cell culture. So my feeling from, from that aspect, but maybe I'll just have a quick one. For the biotech industry, I feel that um, it is just like a lot of biological and biomedical research. It really needs um, a lot of engineering to come into place. If you just watch the way the biologists do their research, you will be amazed at how they can do this again and again and again and again and again with large uh, numbers mm. and the reproducibility is not as good as what we would like to see because there's actually quite a bit of human error. So there's a lot of engineering that need to go into this system and then also now you can see there are a lot of new technology like CRISPR, a lot of engineering of biological systems. So I think this is really a very exciting frontier. Be people start looking at how to engineer biosystems using devices that can automate things that make the research a lot easier and reproducible and faster, and then how to actually go into the biological system and manipulate it okay. reproducibly. I think this is a very exciting frontier. Really encourage a university like Monash to work in that area. Hey. Any more questions from me? Uh, good evening to the professor. All right, I actually have uh, two very simple questions. The first one is basically a technical one based on your uh, pro um, pro presentation. I'm actually quite interested in the energy storage material because I'm also working in the same line. So basically, uh, I'm actually quite impressed with this uh, lithium manganese uh, silicate system. The synthesis method is rather novel. So um, when you synthesize it, it becomes in the form of a nanopowder, right? So uh, how do you uh, overcome the problem of depositing this nanopowder as a cathode material for your energy storage system? That's the first one. And then the second one is basically uh, your position as an editor in Nano Today. Um, as an editor, uh, would you see that um, novelty, if you see a novelty in the research, even though the data is not impressive, but it's novel, do you see this in a positive way or in a not so positive way? Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, no. Making the the cattle and no, I mean there's definitely a lot of tricks, right? Um, in what additives you're gonna use, but there's no fundamental difficulty in using it as a powder. None. Okay. As an editor in chief, you know nowadays uh, people want to publish in good journals, right? Um, and for Engineers, um, impact factor above five is considered very good, right? For, and for most fields, an impact factor above five is very good. And then you have papers, with journals, with impact factor above 10. It becomes increasingly challenging. As you go to higher, higher impact factor journals, they are going to want to have not only novelty, and they're going to really expect you to do very careful, detailed, complete work. Um, with very high quality, okay? So that demand just become higher and higher. Um, for the biological and biomedical areas, it's particularly difficult because invariably you need to do not only in vitro studies, but sometimes even animal studies, and that all takes up a huge amount of time. 
Yeah. So how to do work with high quality, hard work. It's really hard work, right? I mean, it's many times you do something and then you figure, oh, I must do it this way. For you doing your PhD? Ah, so those of you who are doing your PhD know what I mean. Sometimes you might do a PhD in four or five years. The first four years, you're just learning how to do the experiments and then finally the last year, you're repeating all those experiments in the best way you know possible and you get all the best results. Okay, so if you don't put in the hard work, uh, you will not get there. My students and staff in Singapore always ask me to compare them with my MIT student. And I tell them, many of you are very, very bright. There's no question. Uh, students at MIT are extremely bright, but the difference is they are extremely driven, self-motivated, and hardworking. Okay? So when I moved to Singapore, um, I would be busy with my work in IBN, right? And sometimes during lunchtime, I'll get something very simple. I'll bring some food from home, I heat it up, and I, and I would think about them. And then I decide to call them, okay? So you can imagine lunchtime, noontime in Singapore, midnight in MIT, right? But some of them are there. Okay, that's the kind of drive that makes the difference. So when they are young and they're extremely driven and focused, they become very good at it. And that helps set up their career in a certain direction uh, that is unparalleled, okay? Where else, a lot of young people um, in other parts of the world, they might be very talented, but they might not be as focused and driven and know what they want. So knowing what you want to do when you're young is very important. I started my career very young. I started doing my PhD when I was 25. When I joined MIT, I was 25, 26. Mm. When you're young and have enormous amount of energy, hopefully you also have enormous amount of focus and drive. If you have that, you are it. You will be like the athletes that win the Olympics. Okay? So there's, there's no other thing. You don't look at the guy next to you. You, are, you should compare yourself to the best in the world. Okay? This is the most important part for young people in this part of the world. They must realize they're not competing with other people. Next door, they're competing with the best in the world. And people in the same department or the faculty members must not look at each other and compete with each other. They must work together and compete with the best in the world. Only then you can have a chance to be successful. Okay, so this is, I'm sorry I'm preaching a little bit, but this is what I do with my own staff. I always tell them that. Okay, okay I think it's, it's fine to preach now. Okay. <laughs> uh, I think you like me. <laughs> I mean to say to work together, yes. I think just, just a quick one. Uh, going back to your journal, what is currently the rejection rate you know, of your journal? <laughs> rejection rate just, of, just to give an of idea a journal of with impact factor above 15 probably is always more than 90%. I would say it's not. Okay. Okay. <laughs> you, if you want to get good... Um, papers in, you have to be very selective. Because if you're not, and you ask your reviewers to review something, they will feel you're wasting my time, okay? And it's very difficult to get good reviewers. So, you know, and you want to have fast turnaround also, right? Uh, so, yeah, it's really a combination. You making very good decisions. Okay, uh, one last question. Prof, in you actually, um, uh, invent uh, already create that device, the biofluid device, aims to replace the animal models. So I just want to know now, actually, to what extent actually this device have been acceptance as a replacement of the animal model uh, in terms of publications and also in terms of biomedical studies. There are certain things still need a lot of animal study. For example, the drug delivery system, right? You want to know how it works. And... Uh, the problem is God made us differently from the animals. So sometimes things work a certain way in the animals, but then it comes to human, it works differently, right? So what we hope is with the human primary cells, we have good predictability, provided that you use these cells in the right way. Okay, so with these microfluidic systems and 
we can, uh, we can very easily capture the response of the cells to a certain drug at physiologically meaningful dosage. Okay. So now we see a lot of people are interested in using our model to screen. And this is why we just recently set up CellBay to, to do that business. We want to propagate this type of approach because it will save a lot of time and money and hopefully it will save a lot of animal lives. <laughs> so this is very important. I want to emphasize to the young people. A lot of people think that science and technology, okay, just doing research and that kind of thing, but actually you can make a tremendous societal impact, okay? The type of technology you develop can make a tremendous impact, okay? And you can also create a lot of opportunity for great jobs, okay? You want great jobs, new type of jobs for every country, in, including Malaysia, okay? So entrepreneurship is something that comes together with research. A lot of people say, oh, I can do this entrepreneur thing, but if you don't have great technology, there's no way you can be an, a technopreneur at least, right? So I encourage some of you to do this because it requires a lot of uh, good technology and it could, requires a lot of good risk taking. You have a good business school here? Yes, right? Yeah, the best business school. You must make good use of that. You must have schoolmates in different departments coming together to think about business plan. That people here could have the great technology. And then people in the business school, your friends there, could, have, could help you develop a great business plan. And together, maybe you can create a new economy that can make a big difference. Right? Okay, I was told that's one last yeah. question. Uh, okay. prof Professor Zing. Ying, I just want to uh, inquire whether it is possible to use our palm oil base, uh, the tri triconal cola, uh, instead of the green teas. Is it possible or not? <laughs> palm oil, is it? Yeah. I think oil based systems certainly also have possibilities. Um, we use a green tea because we can formulate it into a nano complex very easily okay in Malaysia actually there's a lot of good work with natural products you know I won't be surprised some of those could have very interesting properties because they have very good properties on their own okay so I I'm a good I'm a firm believer of a traditional medicine and things like that because I think that they have very good properties and sometimes don't have a lot of the toxicity and side effects so we should really explore those things. So palm oil might not be the most suitable for that applications, but you know, certainly other natural products could be. Mm. Right, I'm afraid uh, this is uh, all the time that uh, we have uh, for the uh, Q&A. So uh, before we end the program, uh, I would like to invite uh, Prof. Uh, Mahendra Nanai, uh, Vice President, uh, Research and Development, Monash University of Malaysia, to present a token of appreciation yeah, to uh, Prof. Yang. Okay, thank you, Prof. Yang. Thank you, uh, Prof. Mahendran. So uh, that's all for today. I hope you have enjoyed uh, the, the talk and I wish you a pleasant evening and uh, have a safe journey home. Thank you. See you.